na warrel, my territory, my tribes, we are salt water and fresh water, Chandavel and Gurunpul. I'd like to finish by saying I give honour to each of you coming together to talk tonight on such absolutely vital, vital content. I pay respects to the elders past and present and also our ancient neighbours, Kabi Kabi and Waka Waka, Jinnaburra, Yugambe, Bigambul, Bunjalung, Kwandamuka, and also acknowledge we have a Bunjalung sisters talking tonight. I thank the organisers and their partners for cultural respect, having a welcome to country, our Guri Law done at gatherings and events for over 70,000 years with all of us coming together. Yambili Nurubu, Yagaru Jaruna, Guri Nyadagai. Be safe, be blessed. Welcome on Yagara country. Welcome everyone from around the country. I can't see them, but they can see me. Nari Babing, Wanjana, Nuru Nyambali, our great creator. Bless everyone. Thank you and be welcome. Thank you so much, Andy Kerry. Okay, next we'd like to do uh, very brief introductions to who are we, the participants, the people who are listening. Um, so there are a few of us gathered here in person in the cathedral and many more gathered on Zoom uh, here in the cathedral. So we, we sent in the email um, a suggestion that if you could bring a symbol or something that you feel represents you, your organisation, your church, your identity. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has brought that. If you have, then when you hear the name of the group that you identify with, you could either hold up that symbol or you could bring it out and place it here on the altar, if you wish, on our little table. Okay, so here in the room tonight, we have quite a few Catholic people, I think. Thank you, Peter. And uh, a number of Anglicans. also at least one Greek Orthodox person <laughs> and online there are plenty of Orthodox people too um, and I'm not sure of what other denominations are represented and just individuals who care have come to listen tonight so thank you all for gathering on Zoom um, because people registered and gave the information I know maybe when you if you're on Zoom you can um, wave if when you or hold up your symbol if you have one on Zoom we have people from different traditions and a Baptist Anglican, this is the A to Z. Baptist, Buddhist, Catholic, Charismatic, Christadelphian, Churches of Christ, Lutheran, non-denominational, Orthodox, Pentecostal, Quakers, the Red Dirt Church and the Uniting Church. Many organisations are also represented. The Jesuits, Malaysian Care, Community Initiatives Resource Centre, ARC, the Australian um, Religious Response to Climate Change, Green Faith, Presentation Sisters, Reconciliation Australia, several schools and colleges, Tear oh. Fund, uh, an interfaith group, Power to Change, Extinction Rebellion, and various individuals and some acronyms I couldn't recognise. Uh, in terms of locations, we also have people from all over Queensland, as far out as Charleville, every capital city, even Perth and Hobart, um, lots of people from regional and remote areas, uh, someone from a place called Penguin, I don't know where that is, um, and even Malaysia and the UK. So we extend a warm welcome to people who have gathered from many places in order to listen tonight. Okay, I think without further ado, we should move on to our listening. So with great pleasure, 
I'll introduce to you Ani Alex Gaida, who will be our first speaker tonight. Um, Ani Alex is a Wangan and Jagalungu elder, and also she was the first Aboriginal woman in Queensland to be ordained as an Anglican priest. She's also been nominated uh, for a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so uh, there's a lot more that um, we could also say about Ani Alex, but let's uh, leave it there and listen to uh, what she has to say for us tonight. Over to you, Ani Alex. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge our Creator God, to acknowledge all our ancestors from the four directions, to acknowledge the traditional custodians on whose ancestral land we gather, to all our elders, past, present, and future, and to acknowledge each and every one of you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Before I couldn't hear you before. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to touch. I was ordained here 2003 in St. John's Cathedral. <clears throat> now, when I went home to our house, all the family gathered at our house. In our backyard, we have a big tree, a leopard tree. As all the family gathered, seven cockatoos flew into the tree. Seven. And you hear cockatoos? How loud and noisy they are? They were talking. They were talking and looking down at us. And the first thing I said, I just felt a presence all around me. That was my grandfather's totem, the white cockatoo. And they came to give their blessing of seven. What is seven? That is the Lord number. They were in the tree for a while, all talking, looking down, and then they flew off. I said, thank you for coming, my family. Love yeah, you. <laughs> so, back to the Aboriginal people uh, of Australia. When God created the Aboriginal people around the world, he wanted to place them. He placed Aboriginal people here in Australia. They're the caretakers, the custodians, their stewardship of the land. Aboriginal people are a spiritual race of people, a peaceful race of people, a sharing and caring race of people. Are Aboriginal people today, no, we're a, we are survivors. And the Aboriginal people go out in the bush, they read the land and they knew, and they knew it was going to rain. They knew, even when the water holes grew up, right up, they knew where to find water. That's what I'm witnessing today. And what man is doing today? What man is doing today? destroying the environment. They are cutting down the trees, killing our wife, wildlife, polluting the waterways and the rivers, killing all our seafood. All our food and water comes from the land, rivers and seas. And when all the rivers and the water holes dry up and all the food is gone, what are we going to eat? Money? What is going to be left for the next generation? Nothing. Nothing. Well, that, that our ancestors are a caring and sharing race of people. If you had a house full of, you had about three or four families that you always made room for one more. No one was ever turned away. Even when the Great Depression was on, a lot of people said, if it went for the Aboriginal people, we would starve. They took us in and fed us. They took us in and fed us and looked after them. That's where it is today. All that's been passed and we never turn anybody away. And we make a home for everyone. In the Aboriginal prayer, we make a home for everyone in our land. But the people who come to Australia need to be mindful of the Aboriginal people. Because in the Bible it says, you make a home for the refugees, but the refugees ought to be mindful of the, of the First Nation people and to acknowledge and respect. <clears throat> when I go overseas, I've been to a lot of countries around the world, I take a message stick and always get permission. 
I, travelling from my ancestral land to your ancestral land, I come in peace. I bring greetings from all my people, the Aboriginal people of Australia. And I present this message back to you, message of peace. Bring this for my, and that. So then in our culture, we were taught about protocols. You don't walk into someone's house, you knock on the door and you wait to be invited. So that's just some of the Aboriginal people, cultural protocol about respect. And you always acknowledge other clan groups. So I'll just leave it at that and I'll just pass it over to our, and I'll come back and talk to you some more later. I'm not on. Now, now I'm on. Thank you very much, Aunty Alex. That was an amazing summary of so much stuff. I've scribbled down a whole bunch of notes. It's lovely to hear the sense of Indigenous people as being peaceful and spiritual peoples who are caring and sharing and uh, who help other people when it's uh, tough times, like during the Depression. Um, okay, next we're going to hand over to uh, Auntie Rose Early, who is joining us by Zoom tonight. So we'll switch to watching on screen in a moment and Auntie Rose will speak from there. She's from the Torres Strait Islands. She's an elder from Saibai Island in the Torres Straits and she's the executive member of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Anglican Council. Hey, so Larissa, I should probably not call you auntie. <laughs> Uh, Larissa is a proud woman of the Widjabal clan and the Bundjalung Nation, um, which is actually near North Coast, New South Wales area. Um, she's been working as a First Nations Justice Campaign Director for Get Up and is also a co-founder and former National Director of SEED Indigenous Youth Climate Network. So she's been very active already in her short life, younger than most of us, um, in working for climate justice um, with Indigenous people. Um, yeah, please tell us some of your story, Larissa. Thanks for having me. I just want to acknowledge um, that we are on Yagara country and acknowledge all the First Nations people that are here today. Yeah, my name is Larissa. I'm a Widjable woman. I grew up on country down in Lismore. We were just talking about kind of, so for me working in the environment and climate movement and the social justice movement is a little bit weird because I grew up living on country and just working in Aboriginal controlled organisations that were set up by our aunties and uncles. And so this idea of being an activist or a conservationist is not something that I ever really identified with. But when you grow up on country, you know your history and, um, uh, my family, I was very lucky to grow up on country because, uh, you know, in the 1930s, my grandfathers walked off uh, Cabbage Tree Island because of the violence they were experiencing there. And they um, they walked to a place called Kabuyan. It's one of those things, if you drive from Cabbage Tree Island to Kabuyan and realise how far it was to walk and how far our grandfathers walked for us to be on country and to remain on country, um, you really have an idea of like the, the types of things and, the, and, and you understand the violence that they experience in those days around the mission movements and that sort of stuff and the absolute poverty. And the reason that we we're able to live on country and have connection to country is because they did these things. And so they went to a place called Kabui and they set up camp there. And they called it Kabui. Kabui uh, in our language means a place of full and plenty. So, you know, we were very poor. There wasn't a lot going on in terms of like, and then the, when they talk about the violence they experienced when they stepped off the mission and it wasn't a mission that was uh, under the protection of the Aboriginal um, control board. So for a lot of time, they didn't get rations and that sort of stuff and they just have to live off country. So, you know, a lot of the conversations that I have with my dad, who's in his seventies um, about living in there is a bit about a happy time and in, in, in terms of being able to have language and be together with family, but also they were very poor and very scared from a lot of the things that were going on. So for me, growing up with the stories of Kabui, um, you might know, but uh, my, so my grandfather's throughout my family is a lot of pastors. Uh, Uncle Frank Roberts was someone who was part of uh, creating an, uh, the Aboriginal Progressive Association, which were really instrumental in getting rid of the Aboriginal Protection Board. Um, and so growing up with those stories when we were younger, it was, it was kind of the DNA of our family and our ability to fight for country, but to fight to remain on country, but also the, the fight for our family and the fight for equality is all these stories that we grew up with and all the things that our grandfathers and aunties and uncles have done. 
I think for me to understand from a very young age, uh, I got to go out, um, you know, kind of got dragged along with my aunties and would go to the Nyundi Aboriginal Health Council and we would travel to discrete and remote communities in uh, northwestern New South Wales and talk about health issues. Um, and you know, we'd go to communities and talk about how people were being arrested and because they didn't have licenses, but they had to drive from, it'd be like tabulum into different places so people could get dialysis and so constantly people were getting arrested because they didn't have licenses and understanding how health and systemic issues impact our families. And so I ended up coming along to a lot of these types of things, really being dragged along because my aunties and uncles um, couldn't read and write. And so I knew how to, they knew I knew how to use a laptop. So I just got kind of dragged into it. So it wasn't a choice that I made to be in this space, but it was just kind of the thing that our families did. Um, and so when I learned, I was very young, I remember being in high school and learning about climate change and really understanding that um, when you looked at the predictions in the maps and they were talking about places in Australia that would reach temperatures of over 50 degrees, even as a teenager, I was like, this is, climate change really is going to mean the forced removal of country for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's what it means. Um, and so for me, that, that's a huge threat, but when you understand the amount of trauma and the amount of, you know, so much of the issues that we experience within our community come from this di like dispossession and being ripped away from country and how that creates, you know, a lot of the issues in even with young mob, um, you know, something that I'm privileged, I grew up on country, but uh, growing up and then getting involved creating seed as an organisation and meeting a lot of young people who are descendants of stolen generation and, and what that means in terms of your identity and your place in this world um, is, is something that's really important. So the, for us, uh, getting involved in seed and starting seed, we really wanted to... The climate movement is a very white space and um, the way that people talk about climate change doesn't really resonate with the people who are going to be impacted not only by extractive practices, but also by the climate crisis. So, so when you look at the dispossession and the removal and the predictions across the north of Australia, it is really scary when you think about what that's going to mean for people and the amounts of people that are going to have to move if we can't adapt, if we can't kind of fight off the worst impacts of climate change. And so one of the things that we really wanted to do with Seed is to change the conversation around climate change. And instead of talking about climate change, we started talking about protecting country. So I've had the, you know, the privilege to have thousands of conversations, you know, literally thousands and thousands of conversations myself, but as a network across the country with people talking about protecting country because when we talk about country, we're talking about people, we talk about place, we talk about our law, everything is holistic. And when we, when we reframe the conversation around protecting country, we put ourselves in as kind of stewards and custodians and the people that needed, um, the people that need to have the seat at the table and the people that can make the decisions and understand the solutions that we need to it in order to address the climate crisis. So that was a really big piece of work that we did within SEED that we wanted to reframe this conversation around climate change and what it meant. Because from where we were seeing the conversation and the politics there was not a lot of Indigenous people in there. And uh, really for uh, climate change globally, a lot of people don't understand this, but Indigenous peoples globally protect 90% of the world's biodiversity. So it is really important in terms of the solutions to the climate crisis that we have in order to manage the lands. You know, we have seen half this country on fire this year. So in order to do the kind of management of land, and Indigenous people are the best people to understand that in order to get through this crisis, we need to adapt and live and maintain and work with our, system, our, our natural landscapes. Um, and so that was really part of the work that we wanted to do was bringing people back into a conversation and start networking with Indigenous peoples around this country, but also globally in terms of what are the solutions and how can we really build some political power. Um, that led to when we first started working in the NT around fracking, we understood after the intervention that 90%, 99% of the land mass in the NT was covered in licenses for oil and gas exploration. And we had built a network and so like, how do we do this? And is there a community that we could work with? And over the process of the last six years, we've worked with uh, 14 different communities across the Northern Territory who are facing um, fracking. 
talking about originally, we didn't go out there talking about being pro-mining or anti-mining. We went out there to talk about climate change and what it really meant for people. And through the building and organising that we did across kinship lines, uh, really building connection and talking about uh, connection of water and what it really meant for country and what it really means to make an informed decision about whether you say yes or no to mining on your country. Because it's not just about money if in a generation's time, your community is going to need to be moved. And so when people talk about, um, you know, it was, there's predicted that it's going to be a really bad wet season this year, but, you know, three, four years ago, we had all the communities that we were working with trying to stop fracking be evacuated because of cyclones, because their housing is too unsafe to be there in. So they were being flown out in army, you know, uh, jets and that sort of stuff. And for six weeks, put in tents in Catherine, uh, in pouring rain, but just displacing people. And so for the people who, that we work with, um, it's not a question. And, and I see this right across the country when we talk to people, to our mob particularly about climate change. It's not a question about whether climate change is real. We have the largest and longest living data set around country and what it means. And there are oral stories around uh, natural temperature variances and that sort of stuff. We traveled through Queensland and talked to people about these types of things. And people can like, we go into the NT and then be old people and they say, yeah, well, we got the climate change up here. It's like, people know that this is happening, but what we need is a response. And I think, one of the saddest things that we've seen in this country is that we really need to reckon with, and people are talking about right now that we are in a recession. This is the first time in 30 years that we've been into a recession because of extraction and big mining. And for Aboriginal people in this country, 60% of mining happens next to remote communities. And I think there was a big promise that this was going to be the thing that would get people out of poverty, that would, you know, you know even the tables around uh, economic solutions for our communities, and you know, open, unlock this uh, kind of gateway to having basic services like house, housing and health services in your communities or good jobs. And we really haven't seen that come to fruition. In fact, if you look at things like the Closing the Gap report, if you look at the social indicators around um, health services, especially in the NT, but right across the top end, we're going backwards. And so the solution that was put forward not only has allowed mega profits to drive out of this country, but it has also meant that the government has taken a backseat in being the people that are delivering services into a community. We've just been in the NT over the NT election, organising across these communities who are saying no to fracking. And we're not just there to say no to fracking, but we're also talking about, you know, really putting pressure on governments to deliver the types of services. Um, it is really typical to talk to people that are living four families in one household and then many tents in what would be in and around the yard. And that's, there is a huge health and housing crisis right across our communities. And these things are not being addressed in the ways that they should be addressed because these communities don't have the power that they need. So one of the things we've focused on throughout the fracking campaign is really um, bringing the community together and feeling like, you know, there are more people out there that want to take action with them, that understand that there are issues around consent, around the licensing, and that understand that if you unlock the basins in the NT, that's 22% of our current carbon emissions. So we cannot, absolutely cannot open new uh, oil and gas basins. Every single oil and gas basin that the government announces, they are earmarking five basins across the, including the Galilee Basin. At the forefront of all those fights are First Nations people trying to keep those fossil fuels in the ground. And it's not just about country and consent, it's about our future. And, you know, so often I get a lot of hope, like just today, um, We've been talking to the TOs and the NT about, you know, there's a license where this company's come in from the US and they've started fracking and they were very worried that they can't speak for that country. And so we've been stressing about how do we make connections to this community and they're very worried because they're like, they don't want to shame people if they've said yes to fracking. We understand why people say yes to mining because of the economic situation in communities. But we have this amazing situation. I had someone ring someone and then today we found ourselves on a call with a young Gadanji woman and she's talking about my grandmothers. Um, they're saying they've signed off on this thing. Oh, I've seen this announcement. There's ministers out there talking about, and they've seen, you know, these trucks rolling in on our country. She's like, I don't know what to do, but I just want to be connected into, you know, the action that's happening on the ground. How can I help? You know, we've been talking for four or five weeks with TOs in, across the NT around, we need someone from Gandanji to, to come and to speak for their country and we can't speak for their country. And so 
just like in all the mess of all these announcements and on all these fossil fuel fights that was going on to have this young woman come forward. She's in um, Dubai at the moment. She's a, a, a specialist doctor and her partner lives over there, but she's talking about her grandmothers who are living up there and just this ability to make connection and that sort of stuff. And, you know, immediately calling uh, a bunch of the traditional owners in the NT being like, guess what happened today? We've met this young woman and she's really excited to get involved in the campaign. And she's already talking to me here about the fracking that's happening. And, them feeling like yes we can go ahead and we can bring people together and we can keep building power in this community so for me i the issue of climate change for me is a the solution to the climate crisis to me is land rights it's the ability for us to control and maintain and protect and continue our culture and our customs and our law and to live on country and i think that you know a lot of people talk about climate change in this country as lacking leadership and for me, I can see in the work that I do is completely the opposite. We have so much leadership across our communities. And I think that one of the things I really want people to understand is like, there are leaders out there, but maybe they're not the ones that you're listening to. Maybe they're not the ones that you're supporting the calls or amplifying their voices. But if you want leadership that is looking about how we live on this country and how we you know, sustain and adapt to the climate crisis, and you want leaders that are thinking about you know, future generations, then that is really our leadership and it's been happening for generations. Like, you know, you know, talk about having activism and being in activism. I'm young and there's like people like Annie Alex and we're not activists. This is just what it means to be an Aboriginal person and surviving on country. So yeah, there's so much going on, but I also, there is so much more amplification of the fights that are happening for all of us that are being led by First Nations people across this country. Um, they're doing incredibly brave things, uh, uh, talking to investors, talking to politicians, trying to travel around the country and talk to people about what it really means to unlock these new basins. And I think that's really where we need to pile in the support around this country around climate action. That was pretty amazing. Um, I was thinking as you're speaking that uh, you've kind of done the thing that we're setting out to do. You've been round and round the country listening to thousands of people and for a lot of us this is the beginning of our journey of listening to your people and your voices, listening to the voices among us of people who care and people who are being severely impacted um, by changing climate. And it's great to hear such an integrated sense of response, um, framing it as protecting country, and country is not just about earth, but about uh, all aspects of people and country and, and, and sustaining of life. Okay, thank you very much. So this is uh, Dr. Re Arnie Rose Ilu, who's an elder from Saibai Island in the Torres Straits and an executive member of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Anglican Council. Over to you, Arnie Rose. Okay, good evening everybody. I'm sorry there's some technical problems there. Let me have a song the other night. Now, you may have all known me. I'm Auntie Rosilu from Torres Strait, uh, an island called Saibai, on the top western island of Torres Strait. That's where I was born. One of the low lying islands in the Torres Strait. From the air, of course, when you fly through my island, you can only see more water than the land. Then, of course, obviously, this is part of the global warming and the climate change on the, on the islands in the Torres Strait. There's about seven inundated islands in the Torres Strait, two on the top western and five on the central islands of the Torres Strait. Now, this has been an issue for all our people for many decades. I guess it all began when there was a migration out of Saibai to the mainland of Australia on the Cape back in 1940s. The reason was also the the um, uh, the climate change, the, the threat of malaria and the, and the low-lying islands, water supplies, and of course the, the sea levels were were more higher than the, than the height of the islands. And our people were thinking about moving across where they can find the best um, place to, um, to raise their children. Now, I guess in a way that, um, that I became involved in this, you know, when I became um, 
in my um, academic role and, and, um, and addressing this for many years around the nation and, and globally um, in a sense that not many people of this country even um, know about the Torres Strait Islands and not even the politicians themselves. You know, they talk about all these things that they have um, helped our people building up the sea walls and that, but they do not see what it's like to live on the islands and when it's a monsoonal season, how the, how the, how the sea rises up. And then, of course, the well-being and the effect of our people in the Torres Strait then become risky. Now, we know the things that have happened through the years. We've lost our lives in things in the Torres Strait. But I guess the question remains always is, how can it be better built or better looked after the environment that God has given us? Our people is a seafaring people. Our Christian faith, our spirituality lies within the depths of the ocean, the sea, the sky, the moon, the stars, the islands, the cultivation, that he has given us. And the people every day in the Torah said, live happily. Even though that these things are very crucial for the lives of our people, but they feel that faith in God is strong. So they just being normal, living on the islands. But you see, the, the ears has to be opened in many ways, both in the church and government in a way of addressing this. These are the lives of our people, these are our risks. Many things that have come that are abuse, we have the channel across, the ships sail across the Torres Strait in a shipping way out of the Arafura onto, the, uh, onto Asian countries around the world. The shipping comes through and they deposit of many, many rubbish into the ocean. That affects the sustainability of our sea fuels. And there's a place that got caught and, and they waste the oil in the waters of the Torres Strait. So Torres Strait is the, is in, in the position that's where everything is happening, the shipping of the airlines. So people do not understand like what it means to our people. Because we live off the sea and it's only islands, only 17 inhabited islands that have been affected by this global warming. And it's a continuation of the lives of our people in their risk and it's everyday change. We might be colorful in our, in our appearances, happy, smiling. Those are the things that are behind and we, we're thinking of our, our, our children and their grandchildren. What is gonna be like? The world is changing. The depth of the ocean is changing. There, there's a, there's a bed of the ocean that is not very secure. The ones that come, come to the Torres Strait, but we've got three volcanic islands in the Torres Strait. So when you go down fishing and stuff, you can see there's a crack from the ocean. Now, that is something that beyond. I do not know, I do not have the answer. All we can do is address this thing to the, to the authorities. What does it mean to our people? Now, I'm in my position voicing out this issue throughout the world and this nation and continue to we'll, we'll do so because it's the people, the lives that are at risk and we are abusing the culture, the spirit of our people in the Torres Strait. Torres Strait is unique and it's beautiful. When we had the COVID, I was recently on the Torres Strait and I could see the color of the ocean came back. I can see the skies were blue and people, the water was like a still calm, serene. And it was beautiful. Even when I went across the ferry, even the people on the ferry were saying, this is the color of the ocean in the Torres Strait. So in some sense, you kind of think, the COVID came into snow something the God has shown to our people that this is what it's like, this is what it should be. You know, it, it's, 
uh, for me, it's very close into into my mind and into my heart to see that our people every day, even though I live down here, I constantly and continuing having a contact with the people of the low-lying islands. I have a lengthy conversation with them. And their frustration and they, they, their, their conversation and their aggression to the UN nation, they're trying to do this to, to get the world to know what it's like. And not many people know about Torres Strait because Torres Strait is, 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 is very hidden. There are, there are tiny islands between Papua New Guinea and Australia. Now our fate, it lies on that ocean, our people. Now we'll be addressing many of these on next year, the 150th anniversary of the coming of the light. Apart from other things that we'll be showcasing, our culture, our traditions, our heritage, our environment, this will be one of the topics that our people will be talking. They will be aggressive. They will have the workshops going on for the people to educate people. And I guess, in a way, we in the Christian faith, we should really, really closely listen carefully for our other Christian brothers and sisters, known as Torres Strait Islanders. This nation of Australians wrote it also. You go around the coastal towns of Australia, you can see there's erosion, unbelievable. Now what, what is that telling us? What is it? What are we destroying here? What's happening? I have, you know, people said to me, Auntie Rose, how much more can you say or do you do? Do you think the people are listening? And my answer for that, eventually they will, and they are. But we can only carefully leave this for them to see what best they can do to these people, do to these people in the Torres Strait. I went around the Pacific to Tuvalu, to Marshall Islands, to every island that are low-lying in the Pacific, in Micronesia. I saw the people that it was like my people in the Torres Strait. Who's gonna, who's, who's gonna take part in listening and joining us in this journey to, have a, to make a better place for our people to live? You will not move anybody from Torres Strait to other parts because that is our traditional God-given land. It's bad enough our people move from the islands, they have to ask the permission, even though we're under the act for the Aboriginal people of the Cape who gave us the blessing to live, live on those land up there. And they understood what it's like to live on the low-lying islands. Now they take that pattern, we ever so thankful for we established the communities on the Cape York. Then our people, some of them left the islands to come and live on the mainland. The sacredness of our people in the Torres Strait, that is a place for all of us. The water, the sea, the current, the tide, even the seaweed, what inside God has given us to live for many decades in the Torres Strait. I guess in the way that the, 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 the message to the church is, what are you doing? I'm ever so thankful for the people, the committee, that we are in this, in this journey together with me. I'm ever so thankful that you become an important thing. And I will continue to encourage that we keep on talking about it, moving it forward, come up with solutions, come up with things what's best for the lives of our people. I will not stop. I will keep on talking because I have the courage, the God-given gift for me to be able to address these issues amongst others for the lives of our people in the Torres Strait. Our faith is strong. Our spirituality is strong. We embrace the church from 1871 onwards. 
we believe where we are that he has given us this bounty and this beauty of our islands surrounded with many things for us to live and survive and if he's going to humanly destroy it and not recognizing the lives of our people in this sector then what next we give everything to god we give him thanks for the lives of our people and we give thanks to god for the people those who are committed and passionate to address this with our people our original torture land of people in this particular issue i'm ever so thankful and grateful for those of you who are passionately joined hands in hands with us what the land and the sea meant to our people our livelihood our well-being our life i think that is all i have to say thank you thank you andy rose ilu <clears throat> i'm very struck by the words that andy rose was finishing with um, I think often in our churches and in Christian circles, talking about the environment or climate change is seen as a political thing and nothing to do with faith and an unwelcome topic. But it's lovely to hear Aunty Rose saying that our islands, our small islands, it's the beauty and the bounty of the gift from God. And uh, it's our, you know, our love and our duty to look after it, um, but to see so much their land as, as a gift from God. <clears throat> to know its beauty and its bounty. I was also struck by her talking of um, the commitment to, to taking action um, with our children in mind. It's not just about our own lives, it's about the coming generations, our children and their children. Um, and obviously Torres Strait Islands being low-lying islands are, are really uh, suffering the impact much sooner than many parts of Australia because of rising ocean levels and the severity of weather, the storms. Okay, the next part of our evening, we get to do a bit of listening to each other. Um, we're going to break off into small groups. You might have noticed there's little circles of six chairs dotted around the cathedral. So I invite you to, um, in a few minutes, stand up and go and find a little circle. Um, mix around a bit. We hope that our uh, Indigenous elders and guests will spread out and uh, hopefully you'll have an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person in your group. And so we'll have 15 or 20 minutes. So when you get to your group, um, do a quick introduction, 30 second introduction so you hear a little bit about each other and then maybe take a minute's silence to think about and reflect on all that you've heard. How does that impact you? What does it say to you? What's resonating with you? Um, what do you feel drawn to and called to? Um, and then spend two or three minutes each, uh, to take two or three minutes each to say something of all that you've heard this evening so far, what really resonates for you? Um, maybe out of that will come a question that you really want to ask or a story that uh, you could maybe tell in the bigger group. I think what came out for me um, is twofold. One is about how the system that we live in currently, uh, media, government, society, divides communities, um, mm. divides uh, Aboriginal communities within Aboriginal communities, but also non-Indigenous communities and um, Indigenous communities and just all the division, men, women, you know, uh, and so um, coming back to what our speakers have spoken about and listening to ancient voices uh, that there were no fences, as mm. Annie Alex said, we knew our place, but we invited the other in. Uh, so knowing our identity and then sharing that uh, and welcoming. Jason, Jason, John, would you be willing to share what resonated for you and a story? Sorry to put you on the spot. Yes. Yes, I blame, well, uh, I blame myself. <laughs> no, that's all right. Uh, there are a few things, and um, particularly one that struck us was the uh, Larissa story of, or pointing out that climate change is going to be, or is already becoming yet another forced removal of Aboriginal communities from their homelands. Um, we were talking about, you know, that image of people stuck in tents for six weeks as cyclones come through. And as that becomes more frequent and um, one of the members was asking, well, 
what would that look like if in the city uh, you had to uh, relocate people and put them in tents instead of putting them up in hotels or some kind of decent accommodation uh, and to what extent is you know the lack of government supporting some of those communities uh, for safety part of that as well but just but particularly that image of you know having finally almost got to a point in our history uh, where um, you know we're acknowledging what was done in the past we're starting it all over again but this time through refusing to act on climate change very sobering thoughts um, the potential damage from refusing to uh, cooperate refusing to be humble and um, yeah Okay, um, what well, the plan is next that we hand back over to Ani Alex and to Larissa. You could have five minutes each. You could both throw in a few ideas, um, respond to anything you heard in your small group or in the uh, stories that have just been fed back. I think it, is this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, for me personally, like working in climate change, communicating about climate change for so long, I had a the, this year has had a really big impact on me in terms of like feeling really hopeless seeing half the country on fire after we've seen all the massive fires in Brazil and now we're seeing in California and we're seeing that we now we no longer can send firefighters from California to Australia and vice versa which has been so much of the plan around how we protect country um, to this point uh, and Sorry, do people know what that's referring to? There used to be an arrangement where we could use some of the big firefighting equipment that was used in the US during their mm. firefighting season. There wouldn't be an overlap and it could be brought to Australia and used here. But now both fire seasons have extended so that there's an overlap and we can't share the equipment anymore. Yeah, and so for me this year, uh, my country in northern New South Wales is hinterland and rainforest and... Um, there was this resounding conversation that was happening during the fire. So for a lot of people, they call it the angry summer, but in Tabulum, which is one of the communities up near us, those fires started in July and they kept burning for almost over 200 days. And, you know, for those communities, our local Aboriginal corporations and land councils were really responsible for moving people. There was a point when the fires got up near home and they were saying, uh, basically all the firefighters had been diverted down to Taree and basically like get out, no one's coming and no one can come, there's no services to, to bring out people. And for me, I had this moment and this real grief that I sat with for a long time because we had areas of country burn that are really sacred to us mm. as women uh, that are not supposed to burn, that have never been burned. Mm. And I think it was this real feeling of hopelessness that you know, working in so many communities, especially across the top end of Australia, where you know that these climate mm. impacts are going to come and, and the, all the predictions, but really these predictions have been around and they're spot on. One of the things we talked about within the ABC um, and really been trying to push uh, mainstream media and different media services to tell the stories that are happening in Aboriginal communities because there really is a crisis that's happening that's compounding the crisis that we're already facing, mm -hmm. um, whether that's around health or income inequality, all these types of things. And so yeah. for me to be faced with that personally, there was a point where people were like, what do we do in the response to the climate crisis and being in the organisation and being a campaigner that comes from climate? And I was just crying. And it's like, I am so overwhelmed that I don't know what to do. And I feel like everybody had that moment of, yeah. you know, what does this really mean? We can't live in a country where these type of crisis, even this pandemic that we're mm. living through, is part of the predictions around what we do when we don't look after our space and place in the world and our, mm. how much we you know, push into the natural environment and coming in contact with viruses. And now the whole you know, global economies are shut down, people are dying and you know, people are really scared right now. And I think when I look at the US and I look at them, the, you know, people are really scared that the election in a democratic country is gonna happen on, you know, in a couple of days and what that's really gonna mean for people and the amount of unrest that's happening over there. And I feel incredibly scared for a lot of people that I know, but just, you know, the idea that people aren't sending their kids to school because they're so scared about, you know, what can happen because we are living in this space of constant fear. And I think to me, that really typifies what we're talking about in the climate crisis. Mm. Like there are, you know, really scary predictions that in 2025, we will have global crop failures. What does yes. that mean for some Gosh. of the most poorest countries around the world where they rely on, you know, 
the, the aid coming from other countries when we're, we're seeing that happen. We know what's happening with farmers across this country. We know mm. that there is a suicide crisis. All these things are connected. And I think for me, when it comes to climate change, it is really a big problem. It is bigger than all of us. And I, to me, it requires a lot of courage to understand that there is a really big problem that we are facing down that is bearing down on us. We're seeing people, you know, just this weekend in Queensland, we've seen the One Nation uh, vote collapse in Queensland. And I don't think that's necessarily about people rejecting a platform because I actually think that the One Nation didn't run on an issue, you know, they run on race and division and that sort of stuff. We know this type of politics throughout Queensland. But also I felt like within the Queensland campaign, there were different political parties that for the first time talked about issues and talked about what change they could make in people's life. And that type of politics in this country, regardless of which way you vote, is actually what we need to be talking about because we are at a, at a time where we need to make a lot of change. We need to let change a lot of the ways we do business. We need to change the way that we work, the way that we live with country, all these things. And that means that our elections and the type of action, that bold action that we're going to take and the courage to do that when we're having crisis bearing down on us. It's not good enough that the government is coming out and saying, well, we'll have, a, we'll have jobs and a gas-fired recovery. Mm. You can put a, spend billions and billions of dollars on gas, you can spend billions and billions of dollars bu building housing for communities right across Australia. And it would create more jobs and it would be more beneficial for people. Mm. Um, and so I just feel like right now it is, you know, 2020 is typified and people feel very overwhelmed and I've, you know, spent a lot of this year crying, but also what are we going to do? Like, if we don't do anything about this, we know what the predictions are saying. The predictions are coming through at an alarming rate and they're right on time in terms of the, the timing. And um, I just think that courage and that ability to bring people constantly in and to talk to them, get people to understand mm -hmm. what this really means and to give people agency in this and mm -hmm. to work together, that... You know, it sounds like airy fairy, but it is. It, it really matters. I think mm. in terms of solutions. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. I think that's um. Yeah, it's so true. I, like as you're speaking, I'm thinking that we <clears throat> find ourselves in the middle of a couple of major global crises. <clears throat> And we not only need to ask the question of how do we get out of here, what do we do next, but also those more reflective questions about how do we get ourselves into this, because that's also a key for how do we get out of it. And um, I think ignoring the wisdom of our Indigenous peoples has been one of the ways that we've gotten into it. We've been ignoring um, the natural limits of, of the planet, of the earth, of the environment, and we've been ignoring a lot of good wisdom about how we do community together as people and how we are, look after each other. Um, yeah. Okay. Would anybody like to ask one question or shall we move on? We've got, we're, we're just about a minute ahead of time. If you wanted to try to elicit something from Annie Alex by asking a more specific question. Oh, Peter. Yes, please. Thank you. The microphone. Uh, thanks, Annie Alex and Larissa. Um, Larissa, I know you spoke about the climate movement being very white. Um, and I found this conversation useful, but do you as First Nations people find this sort of conversation useful? And what sort of things would you suggest we do to make it better um, um, so that we're listening more attentively to the people whose country this is? Um, I think that this is not about telling people to to go away or to I, like I actually feel like when we say to me right now the fight for land rights is being re reinvigorated across this country and it really has been you know it never went anywhere but it is kind of deafening the amount of action that is happening across the country and that has been happening really in a, in a solid way around fossil fuels and climate change for the last you know five to ten years um really people understanding that this is this is something that we need to take action on and i think that sometimes a lot of people say to me well what can we do and that sort of stuff and it's just like 
pay attention to the fights and the people that are talking out there and actually what we do at Get Up is a non-Indigenous organisation, but we amplify the messages that people are talking about, whether that's with Wangarin Jagalingu, whether it's traditional owners, whether it's people talking about housing, uh, women talking about, you know, clean water in the NT. All these type of things, we have an ability and we have platforms and we have communities that we exist in. And to have those conversations um, within our communities about what is happening for frontline communities is the way that we are going to have solutions that work for those communities. Mm -hmm. Because if we just have those communities in very white dominated privileged spaces that understand climate change, um, you can bet that the types of solutions aren't gonna be the solutions that are going to allow people to live on country uh, in the top end of Australia. Like right now we're having this argument around, you know, building housing, there's a housing crisis in the NT, but at the same time, they're saying that they build these houses with a with a cut out hole that says that's the place for the air conditioner. An air conditioner is no longer a luxury in the NT. People need these things. There's nothing special about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that is going to allow you to survive without water or in extreme temperatures. So I think people need to understand that climate change is a human issue, that it's a moral issue and that, you know, even when it comes to mining, we know this country has great, got great benefit from mining. That's going to take a transition. That's not about demonising workers. That's about actually thinking about what are the solutions, the industries that we need to build? Where are the communities that have really, you know, paid, you know, sacrificed a lot in order for us to have electricity in big cities and stuff like that? And we need to transition that. But that is a political conversation that we need to be willing to have, that we are going to make this shift. And if we don't have everyday people having those conversations. We're never going to have the, like kind of this critical mass in order to shift people. Um, and it means that we are going to have a really big reckoning in this country with fossil fuels. We have to. We know that the science says we need to leave all, all new coal and gas basins in the ground. Um, and that fight can't be just left up to a few different Aboriginal communities to take that on themselves. This is the biggest lobby group that we have in this country. Uh, where they, we know that the mining tax and they lobbied, uh, big corporations have lobbied really hard to um, you know, get rid of uh, emissions trading schemes and all this sort of stuff. But not only that, we're in this moment at the moment, people might have seen uh, the Dukan Gorge being destroyed for an iron ore expansion. You know, there's a lot of talk happening in the investment community, but at the same time, we have people like Gina Reinhart, Tuggy Forest, these big mining corporations in Australia saying, hang on, you don't need to change the Federal Act, the Federal Act that would provide protection and provide uh, a way for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to say, hey, our cultural heritage is at risk here and we need someone to have a look at this and we want to stop work right now and have an investigation. We have this big mining corporation saying, no, we don't need a check and balance. But it is incumbent on every person who lives in this country to protect the cultural heritage of this country. You can't have disasters like blowing up the Drupal Gorge. You can't have, you know, people cutting down directions trees in the um, in Victoria as well. Because you know, one of the people that was on the Zoom was just saying, you know, we have come so far. We know that it was wrong to remove people from country, but we are also walking blindly into doing it again. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like the ability to turn up and understand that these issues are not an issue for First Nations people to fight by themselves. Yeah. Okay, so it's very much a people's issue. It's an issue that affects us all, but we shouldn't assume that the answers that we come up with is what works for other people. So we need to listen to other people and amplify the voices of the people who aren't being heard. Um, now, there's one really good question to finish with that has come out of the Zoom group. And the question is for the panel, where do you find hope? So let's have a little snippet of where you find hope in all this, and then we'll go into our final activity for the evening. Where do you find hope? Hope. Hope, yeah. With so much that's difficult and a big well, struggle. Hope, and... hope for a better future, you know, let's, let's go and let's stop uh, locking the trees down. You know, wherever you go, in the north, south, east, west of Australia. Uh, this is my country up there, grandma, great grandmother's country, Wagga Jagalinga, <coughs> up near the Claremont. Mm. Right? Where well, they got in there and they cleaned the land. And yeah. all the trees, and it's the, the size of four football fields or six football fields. So I think that's yeah, what destroys your hope. And, uh, yeah. In the face of all Pardon? that land clearing, Annie Alex, what gives you hope? 
well, how to feel like this? You hope for a better, better future if they, the government stopped being it. And as we said, you know, they've accumulated their wealth and the suffering of the people. We're going to see, you know, changes. And then they provide a service for people. Nobody should be homeless. And this is hope, hope for a better future. You know, and you see justice and listen, stop the environment. And um, otherwise, there won't be anything left for the next generation. As I said earlier, you know, in my first week, what's going to be left for the next generation? You know, they're destroying you know, the water holes and everything there. And, and through greed, man has destroyed this environment through greed and uh, they hope for a better future that, you know, that yeah, will be there for something for our next generation to enjoy. Mm. Yeah, so That's despite right. everything that you see, you have hope for a better future. Um, that greed and destruction will not win. Larissa? Um, for me, I think that there is a kind of like a new political momentum happening around <coughs> injustice around First Nations people. You're starting to see that the conversations, you know, the work that's been done by grassroots organisers to get people out on the street and to, you know, to, to, even when you talk about, you know, black deaths in custody and that sort of stuff, the ability for these really brave families to get out there and tell their story mm. and how much that is convincing people to get out on the street with us or to have those conversations in their workplaces or for organisations and companies in this country to stand up and say, actually, that's not okay. And to hold people accountable. We've seen some of the biggest super funds coming out against the Duke and Gorge saying, we need some uh, principles in here around how this thing happened because that's not accepted because what you destroyed is not just a significance here in Australia, but it is global significance. And also it's not okay to hurt and harm people like this. And so mm -hmm. I think that the, that gives me a lot of hope, but also like little things in terms of like when we went into the lockdown um, where, you know, working with a bunch of mob across the NT and we we're talking about, you know, we're not going to be able to come out there. We're not going to be, we're not sure where we're going to be able to come and run an election campaign with the biosecurity zones. And one uncle's like, oh, well, we're just going to have to learn how to do Facebook then. <laughs> he doesn't even have a phone, but like, <laughs> it's great. And we did work out how to do it and get technology to people. And so people are, are willing to, you know, bridge those barriers in, in order to be connected. And then, you know, getting really, once the biosecurity zones were lifted in the NT and getting in there and, you know, seeing if people were still, you know, ready for, uh, to do election organising and to work within their communities and do a lot of the work that we had planned earlier in the year. And we just got out there and people were just like, I was like, how was lockdown? We heard all these stories about, you know, people, you know, sh you know food in the shops and that sort of stuff running out. And they said, mm. it was great. We had everyone in the same place on country together. Yeah, there was no food in the shops, but that's the government. But we can go, like, one of the uncles was like, yeah, but we got supermarket out in the bush. So we don't need, it doesn't matter. But they were talking about how for them to be back on country, to have kids on country for a long, for weeks on end, the ability to go out on the homelands and just be like, forget about, you know, what's happening in, you know, in the cities or even in town and that sort of stuff. That was a really good energising thing for their families. And they're like, we can't wait for second lockdown. I was like, we don't need second <laughs> lockdown. But things like that and like being able to see the positive in solutions and, and situations that we're in. Um, what we'd like you to do is if you picked up a luggage tag on your way in, this is your moment to use it. And if you didn't, there's little cardboard luggage tags on that table over there. <coughs> we're going to each just take a moment of silence. We'll take about five minutes all together, take a few moments of silence to think, out of all that I've heard tonight, what is my intention? Out of what I've heard tonight, I intend to dot 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 so you're not swearing to god or putting it in legal or anything but you have an intention in your heart you're feeling drawn towards something something that's resonated something that's new something you maybe want to learn or something you want to do so take a card write on it your intention um, and i invite you to take it and write it and then come and kind of put it up here as a symbolic offering um, you can collect it again later to take home or you can take a photo of it and leave it here for us how you wish but it would be nice to write on it and come and leave it here and we'll have a bit of a picture of the intentions that we hold together as a group. Okay we've just had a contribution from Annie Rose about what gives her hope. She said working together and it being a team effort is what gives her hope. So that's a, a great note uh, to finish on, really, because this feels like this has been a great opportunity to work together 
if you call listening work, but I think listening is a really good start to the work to come. And I'll just hand over to Kerry to close in prayer for us. As an elder, I've come over here to sit to our aspiring, inspiring, up and coming elder in decades to come. Long time. Very proud of her. And um, I think uh, the question about what is our hope? This is our hope. Well said. She represents our young and our upcoming and our future, our future ones. That's our hope. As an elder, that's what we talk about. Core of our culture is caring for country so that it is pristine and is feeding and nurturing and nourishing our grandchildren's children. And that's the, that's the law and that's our spirituality for every generation. And that's why 70,000 years of having that as our core spirituality and law, caring for country, our yuris and our ecosystems has meant that we've had this beautiful country and it will change because our young are learning more and more and we're handing over more and more and they're getting educated more and more. And they're some of the themes that um, come out of our circle. It's not my original theme. But I'd like to, I just wanted to say that, that's my expression on reflecting about this evening. If you don't understand about Aboriginal Guri, as we say here, Guri, the core of Guri, essence spirit of Guri, what our Yuri means, what our Yuri means, which is our ecosystem and our responsibility, that it has to be learnt. That has to be connected with. So each of us talked about it in a different way tonight and we live it every day. So I'd like to close in a prayer for those listening um, elsewhere. Annie Rose, who uh, spoke so eloquently, and um, Annie Alex, our, our, our young un, our hope, and, um, oh, sorry, Larissa. I had the isses, but not the... <laughs> and, of course, my, my peers um, in the room here too, Ravina and Peter and Sandra and Jean, who we've all worked with for years, and, of course, guided with, uh, by Annie Jean as well. My prayer is that um, as we close, that we think of on the presence of coming together this evening, listening to the voices of each other, listening to the questions, honour those questions, thinking about the hope and to have somebody like Larissa going into our schools, coming into our churches, into our spaces, making the place for that. And as uh, Kev Carmody's song says, you know, from little things, big things grow. Without the uh, country, without the waters, without healthy lands, waters, we won't have healthy people. So my prayer is that we each go away and Think about what we wrote on the tags this evening. Think about what we can do in our corner, in our space, in our home. Learn about the ecosystem and how we can create more, heal more, and also support 
people like Adrian, who's just gone through that battle and has now got a big bill. And how we can influence the governments to take it more seriously. It's not just the masses, the voices of the masses, but it's of the smaller groups. As we come together and join together, I pray the Holy Spirit, I pray our great Gurumba, Bing Wanjana, our great spirit, our Yahweh be with us and show us and teach us the way forward. I pray we're all blessed and protected and inspired and aspired as we go forward from here this evening. Bless those who organise this and we thank you. Thank you all and thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Friends, that brings us to the end of this event tonight. Thank you so much to all of you who've joined us uh, on Zoom from across the this great southern land and from around the world. It's just been such a privilege to share this experience with you. Um, we're going to do our best to send back some of those intentions to you and any links that have been shared and anything else uh, our speakers would would like to share with you um, and we look forward to continuing the journey with all of you god bless hey good night auntie rose good night auntie rose thanks for joining us